All right, welcome everyone. This will be a crash course on small cap trading, the 10 lessons of every small cap trader in the markets. Uh, some of you guys may be beginners, some of you guys may be intermediates or advanced. Um, and this is really a crash course just to get you up to speed with all the things that you should be that you should know when you get into small cap trading. Um, so just a moment to introduce myself. My name is Tom Salerno. Um, I have been active in many communities in the small cap trading realm. Um, I've been part of several, I am part of several discords that you may see me lurking around. And I'm also a part of Trade Journal. You will see me posting uh, blogs and articles and uploading my trades every day uh, in the Trade Journal community. So uh, I also have three years of small cap trading experience up until this point. Um, who knows when you've been, when you are watching this course, it could be two years from now, three years from now. Um, hopefully um, I should be, I should be still trading two or three years from now. Um, I don't see myself stopping. Uh, I really found this uh, to be um, a lifelong passion uh, for me. Um, I do love trading. And we all have our ups and downs with it. And, you know, I started to become profitable after a year and a half or two years uh, and starting just now sizing up from there into uh, my strategy. And so this course is really just designed to give you a quick, um, um, give you a quick rundown on all the things that you should look into and what you should study when it comes to the small cap market. And there's so much to learn and there's a lot that you don't know that you need to know. And so that's what this course is, is just to give you a quick rundown of all the things uh, that you should be looking at and all the things that you should be studying in order to develop a strategy for yourself and in order to um, achieve the things that you want to achieve. Um, it's just designed to make you self-reliant in the market. I don't want you, um, you know, feeling that you need to watch a certain live stream every day. Uh, I used to do that or look at alerts. I used to do that. I fell into all those traps that people commonly fall into when they first start getting into the market, such as, you know, I was following Tim Sykes alerts uh, for the first year, first two years. I also felt like, uh, well, first off, the alerts never works. I was always late to the party and I was always buying what everyone was selling and I was just getting caught in dumps. Um, and secondly, after that, I went to live streams. I was like, I have to watch Ross Cameron's live streams every single day. And I literally sat down and watched his live streams every single day, which looking back at it now, I did learn a lot. However, I was taking the same exact trades that he was taking and those trades weren't exactly geared with my personality. Maybe I those weren't trades that I should be taking. Um, and so it really took me, you know, a lot of time to really face myself in realizing that I need to like stop just watching other people and stop tr copy trading other people, and I need to just go off on my own. I need to just set off on my own path, uh, you know, learn the fundamentals and take that and kind of create my own strategy that works best for me. And so that's what the goal is to get profitable is, you know, to be able to, you know, take everything that you can learn, which I will show you here today, everything that you need to look at, everything you need to study, uh, everything you need to learn to be able to take, uh, take all that information and develop your own strategy so you can become profitable in the markets and self-reliant, not relying on anybody else except you and your computers and the markets. That's really all you don't, that's really all you need. Everything else is just icing on the cake or just an external additional uh, aid rather than the main thing that is helping you uh, to, to stay profitable because you want to be able to just sit down every day and just look at the market and trade just by yourself and you should be able to have those skills and experiences uh, to be able to carve out a profit in the market with just that. Um, not relying on any, any one specific markets um uh, market live stream or alerts so uh so thank you guys for tuning in for this course uh it's going to be relatively quick um 
It's going to be about, I'm going to, the goal is going to be about a three hour course time uh, with about 10 to 15 minutes per lesson. Uh, we can go through what I have planned. Um, so the first lesson is uh, what is a small cap? So just general, like what what is a small cap and why is that different than any other types of stocks in the market and why do certain traders like to focus um, on these types of stocks? Then we'll go to float. We'll understand float and um, how that can influence the price action of a stock, volatility expectations. Uh, the third lesson will be understanding volume profile and why volume is so important um, in judging um, the volatility of a stock or how big uh, the move could be or if it's a stock in play. Uh, the fourth lesson will be reading your chart patterns and your daily charts. Uh, let's see here. Lesson five is going to be reading market sentiment, which is also very important, which was a game changer for me. Reading, reading market sentiment um, is definitely big. Uh, then we're going to go to uh, market indicators, so indicators, uh, the indicators that I use and also other indicators that other traders like to do, like to use, and we'll go over uh, some of those uh, that you can use to kind of aid your trading. Lesson seven will be depth of markets. So depth of market is going to be, you know, your level two. Uh, so it's going to be like your level two, your tape reading. Um, and your yeah time and sales and level two, uh, that's going to be very important, especially with timing your entries and your exits. Lesson eight is going to be your journaling. Journaling, how do you start journaling? Your screen recording, if you want to start to screen record, which is very helpful, reading your statistics um, and how to use um, some platforms that are online, which ones are for free, which ones are paid, and how you can use those to uh, improve your trading. Lesson nine will be finding stocks. What do we do every single day when we wake up or whatever time zone you're in? When you sit down at your desk, what should be the first thing that you do? How do you find these stocks that you want to trade? Um, so that's going to be lesson nine. And then the 10th lesson is going to be setting rules and boundaries. So that will be very, very important. Um, you know, uh, how to develop rules for yourself and um, how to stay disciplined and how to st and stick to those rules uh, and know not to break them and also know sometimes um, it's okay to break some rules. It's okay to break some rules in the right moments and what are those moments? Um, what are those moments that you should be breaking rules if you should be? So that is my sort of outline of where this course is going to be headed. Um, I hope you guys are excited and interested in all of these topics that we're going to be exploring over these next few hours in this course. Um, so yeah, let's get right into it and I'll see you guys on the first lesson, all right? All right, so welcome to lesson one. Lesson one is going to be pretty baseline uh, information about what is a small cap company. So small cap companies are any company uh, on the stock on the stock market or the stock exchange uh, that has a market cap of less than two billion dollars, around two billion dollars um, and below is going to be considered a small market cap. And within the small market cap, there's also micro caps, nano caps, which are much, much smaller on the smaller end of the scale in the small cap companies. So, and market cap uh, is pretty much just the valuation of the company. And you can find that based upon the shares outstanding on the market um, times the stock price will give you the market cap or the company valuation or the amount the company is worth on the stock market. And the reason why um, a lot of people love to trade small market cap companies is because um, to influence the price of the stock, it takes a lot less amount of money to move a small market cap stock 10% than it is for something like Tesla or something like GE or something like General Motors. Uh, to move something this 10%, you would need an insane amount 
of buying volume, just an insane amount of demand, insane amount of influx of dollars to influence this price 10% uh, because this stock here is in a large market cap. Um, the value of the stock, the value of the company is much, much bigger than these small cap companies. Um, and the shares outstanding on the market are insanely bigger than the small cap companies. So it's going to take uh, an insanely amount of insane amount of money to be able to move a stock like this 10% versus something like HKD, which we saw earlier in this year, in the beginning of the year, this stock went from $10 to $69 in about two days, about a 600% move. And something like this, um, since it's a small market cap, has a low amount of shares outstanding, which shares outstanding or float we're going to find out is our supply and when you have a news driven catalyst uh, that hits the market you can get an influx of volume from potential buyers trying to get in on this next big thing or they think that the stock is going to fly because of the small market cap so everyone starts to buy and you get this insane um, volatility in the stock price Sometimes these stocks just go straight up, just like we see here on HKD. And um, you don't need as much buying volume or buying uh, dollar buying volume to influence HKD as it does GE. So when you see this nice um, news catalyst hit the market and the market uh, receives it well and it reacts positively, you can see moves upwards of, yeah, 600%, 1,000%. Uh, more often you'll see... Uh, moves will top out in the stock markets uh, in the small market cap in the stock market about like 50 percent 100 percent 200 percent that's usually where the stock market uh, where the small market caps top out uh, in the in the stock market but we've definitely seen moves much bigger that just keep on going and keep on going and keep on going um, hkd for example just it just kept going day after day uh, two days in a row, it topped out here at 69. And uh, sometimes you just never really know how high these can go. Um, and that is because of that um, that supply and demand ratio can be influenced so much more on the scale than it is on the larger companies. Uh, let's say like a million dollars to buy a million dollars of GE will influence the demand just a little bit and you'll have like a small increase in price to balance that out. Um, but something like HKD, which the supply is like, I think it was like a million shares or less than a million shares. This is a micro cap company. Um, to get a million dollars buying of HKD, the demand goes spikes all the way up here. And imagine how the price is going to react in the market when you get a quick spike of demand uh, from this new driven catalyst. Uh, the price is just going to go whoop, go straight up, pretty much parabolic, uh, to be able to account and balance out that demand. Um, so that's why traders love uh, the small cap, um, small cap realm is because of that volatility, and we can capitalize on that volatility. Um, and to make a couple percent in the market is a lot more reliable in the small cap world than to make a couple percent in the large cap stocks because they just don't move um, that, um, that reliably a certain percent every single day. Like you don't see um, GE moving 5% every day. You only see it moving a half a percent every day. And so to account for that percent move, you would need to take like a $100,000 position or $150,000 position if you just wanted to make 100 or $200 a day in the market. And a lot of people don't have 100 thousand um, dollars to trade in the market uh, even with leverage you would probably need twenty five thousand dollars and most people don't have access to trade with twenty five thousand dollars and if you're starting trading and you don't if you're just starting trading you don't want to use twenty five thousand dollars because that's so much to risk when you're first getting into something you want to you know start small and Learn the ropes before you size up, and so you wouldn't want to even use twenty five thousand to trade, anyways. So that's why a lot of people gravitate to the small cap because to make a few hundred dollars in the market on something like what is moving today, EXAI, 
Uh, this one is popping up today. Um, something like this um, with a with a ten thousand dollar account, which you know is a lot more uh, easily accessible than it is twenty five thousand or fifty thousand um, dollars. You can even trade with a five thousand dollar account, and you can make a two or three percent move on EXAI a lot more uh, reliably than it is to G for GE or Amazon. Uh, this stock is up on the day from yesterday about 35%. So 35% overnight. Intraday, you could you could have traded this on the front side move here. This is about a 13% move. And even if you caught just a small little move, let's say of 5% or 3% of EXAI, that's, that's $100 to $200 a day right there. Um, on five thousand dollars, and it's a lot more um, easier to get access to five thousand dollars than it is fifty thousand dollars. So that's also another reason why a lot of traders get involved in the small cap realm. It's because you don't need a lot of money to really make a decent chunk uh, consistently every single day. And every day we usually do have something that's moving at least at least ten to twenty to thirty percent, if not a hundred or two hundred percent. Um, and a lot of times you'll have those days, those outlier days of a 10% day. On a 10% day on $5,000, that's a $500 day. And that's a really, really good return and much more likely to be able to get in the small cap realm than it is the large cap realm. So that's really the reason why a lot of people love the small caps and especially a lot of new traders like to gravitate to the small caps is because um, you can make more money on a smaller account um, than it is on the large cap stocks and the large cap stocks they don't always move um, they don't always move every single day and you're not really able to capitalize on that move every single day um, it's really hard it's much much harder to um, capture the percent move on the large cap stocks than it is the small cap stocks uh, especially in the small cap if you have a news driven catalyst you can get that huge influx of volume and you really, sometimes you just don't know how high some of these stocks can go and they can really, really catch you off guard and really surprise you. Um, but again, uh, let's not only talk about the upside of small cap stocks. Also, the big downside of small cap stocks is just, is just how some of these stocks can go straight up. They can come straight down um, with no support, no bounce. They don't need to do, you don't, stocks don't need to do anything. Um, if they don't want, they can go straight down um halt down they can get delisted i've seen stocks get halted and go delisted and people lose thousands of dollars um and not being able to sell their position it happens the risk is there um just like the reward is really really high in small cap stocks the risk is also really really high so that's definitely something that you're going to need to tackle when you're getting into these small cap stocks uh, because if you can't manage your risk, uh, the downside can be so, so devastating um, because you're going to take big losses. You're going to definitely take a big loss every now and then in the small cap stocks. It's just inevitable. Uh, you just have to learn to bounce back. You have to learn to cut your losses fast. You're going to have to learn um, the signals, the sell signals to get out before the dump comes. Um, and you're going to have to be able to emotionally handle um, huge moves to the downside in these stocks because you're not going to have a, a, a winning trade every single trade so uh, that's definitely a warning to people you know getting into the small cap realm uh, a risk is there um, but where when there's big risk there's also potential for big reward um, and so that is really the industry or the sector that you're getting into uh, when you're trading small cap stocks versus if you're getting into the large cap stocks but um, it is really a double-edged sword. It can be really, can be really, really powerful uh, trading um, trading these small cap stocks because of that potential reward. But then also, you know, the downside can also be very devastating if you're not able to cut your losses quickly. So that was sort of the rundown of the basics of a small cap. And uh, these next lessons are definitely going to be a much more in-depth um, in specific uh, small cap stocks. So. Uh, stay tuned for that. All right, so now for lesson two, we're going to be talking about float. Float is very, very interesting because 
um, is actually something that a lot of people are not aware of when they're first getting into the uh, small cap w world. A lot of people have no idea what a low float is. Um, when I first started trading, believe it or not, I thought a low float was like some stock that was like kind of like fading off the lows and like curling back up. I thought that's what low float meant, which in reality, low float, low float is the supply of a stock. It's the amount of shares available to buy and sell on the market. So for float, let's just take a look here. So we're gonna type in BPTS, which is one of the stocks that are moving, gapping up today. Um, so if you just come scroll down on, this is Finviz, by the way. Finviz is a site that a lot of traders like to use um, to find a lot of market data on the stocks that are moving. There's also a couple of other ones. You can use Guru Focus. Um, you can use uh, float tracker, float checker. That's also another good one. Uh, but we're going to use Finviz just for the sake of this video. So we have our shares float is right here. And that is about 2.39 million shares. So 2.39 million shares um, at the markets uh, available to buy or sell. May seem like a lot, you know, millions. Oh my God, there's a million shares. But in reality, um, that is not a lot at all. 2 million shares. So 2 million shares of a $1.25 stock, that is um, 2 million shares times $1.25. Let me pull up my handy dandy calculator because I can't do this right now in my head. 1.25, whoops, 1.25 times 2,000 shares. So you'll only need to have 2.5 million, only 2.5 million dollars to buy up and own this entire company um, that are that's a, for the shares available to buy or sell. Obviously, there's institutional ownership, which is the difference between shares outstanding. So, shares outstanding is the amount of shares issued by the company. Um, and then some of that is going to be owned by, let's say, the owner, the CEO, the employees, uh, other institutions uh, that are going to buy up the stock as well. So after all of that, there's 2.39 million shares available to buy um, on the market. So if I, somebody comes in and buys 2.39 million shares, um, there will be zero shares available to buy. Um, and the next available share that is going to be willing to be sold by anyone who's holding this stock of 5 million or 4.8 million shares, they might have their best offer might be $4 a share or $5 a share. And that's why you'll see the stocks can just rip straight up um, if somebody is buying so much of these small cap stocks. And you only need $2 million, $2 million, $2 million um, you only need 10 people to buy $200,000 worth of stock or 200 people of, or I'm sorry, a hundred people of $20,000, a hundred people trading BPTS. If there is a news catalyst on the day, if there's a news catalyst on the day and there's a lot of volume in the stock, there's definitely a hundred people out there. There's way more than a hundred people out there trading this long, first of all. And there's definitely a hundred people out there that have $20,000 that are willing to buy this stock. Um, and you could see um, these stocks move really fast um, in conjunction with the low amount of shares available. So um, it really is um, an important metric to check every single time that you before you trade a stock because you're going to notice that the stocks with a smaller float, the stocks with a smaller float are going to have much, much more volatile price action. Um, they're going to be able to move a lot faster, uh, potentially skipping dollars a share in a certain hot market conditions, um, and they won't be well, I don't know if I could say it's choppy. There definitely could be choppy, but on the other, the flip side, 
more higher float stocks, higher float stocks are going to take a lot longer to um, um, to pan out its move because it has a lot more shares to churn before it eventually uh, makes the move, whether to the downside or to the upside. So it's got a lot more uh, ground to cover because of the, all of those shares uh, for it to make a move, and it likely will not have the same juice uh, or the same amount of legs that you could see um, with some of these smaller cap uh, stocks. So um, ideally for someone like me who primarily focuses on small cap stocks, I love stocks with a float less than 20 million. Less than 20 million is my sweet spot. I will trade over 20 million. Between 20 million and 50 million, I will trade anything over 50 million then I need to start kind of adjusting my strategy because my strategy is based on small cap, low float stocks. So anything with over on a higher end of the spectrum of float, which would be you know 50 million to 100 million or more, then now I'm starting to need to adjust my strategy and looking for uh, a longer hold times because of that amount of time that it takes for all those shares to churn in order to res uh, resolve into a move. Um, so that's kind of how I view float. And again, you can use Finviz, which is totally free, uh, to check out your float statistics. Um, you can get also in a lot of other things. You know, you have your outstanding, your float, you have your institutional ownership. Uh, you have, so 50% institutional ownership. So that's pretty much shares outstanding times 0 0.50 is 2.39 million. So that's how they got the float there. So. That's what you want to look at, shares float. On, um, if you look on uh, TOS, if you're using TOS, this shares button, you can have this shares button. However, it is not 100% accurate. Right now it's showing 5.3 million. Um, so this is shares outstanding. There, unfortunately, there is no, at least what, I've, what I have done research on and what I have found on TOS um, with what they provide. Uh, on Thinkorswim is they don't have a float a float option. It's just shares, and shares is pretty much resulting in the uh, referring to the shares outstanding, which is somewhat accurate. It's off by half a million, but um, you, you can kind of get a rough estimate of the shares outstanding with Thinkorswim. But I'm not sure. We're not we're not 100 sure this is accurate um, because now this is showing a different uh, a sh different number there. So. Um, you can use that for a, a rough estimate if you need to just go off of something real quick. Uh, and if you don't have time to pull up Finviz, you can kind of go off of that. But then again, you know, that's your shares outstanding. That may not be the amount of shares available to buy or sell. If there is a stock with um, a, a high institutional ownership, like 80 or 90 percent, then you could have a hundred million dollar share, hundred million dollar shares outstanding showing here that may not even be on your radar. They may actually have a 20 million shares uh, float, but this will show 100 million and it will be off your radar because the float would be too high. Um, so you definitely want to double check with these uh, other sites, Finviz, Guru Focus, Float Checker, etc., uh, just to get an idea of the float of the stock that you are trading. So. That is roughly that is roughly the the importance of float. So the importance of float again is just that is the supply of the stock, and that can give you that expectation of volatility in the stock. Um, it can also give you you know the um, the extremes of risk, high risk, high reward. If the float is under a million, if the float's under a million, that's when you start to can get into those halting sort of price action where it just halts, halts, halts every minute. Um, again, you know, that's very high risk, high reward because of the small supply. And especially if there's a news catalyst that's driving volume, that's where you can get those massive moves to the upside, but also to the downside, uh, especially with floats even under a million. That's when, you know, stuff starts to get really crazy um, and really risky and also high reward. So, that's a little rundown on float. Um, so that's definitely going to be a key component in your analysis of every stock. Um, and next, we're going to go under understanding our volume profile, which is 
really, um, really uh, in a direct relationship with supply in order to drive the price in the market. So uh, stay tuned for that. All right, so now for the volume profile. Understanding the volume profile is very, very, very important uh, because without any volume, if you're just trading something like this, oh wow, you could be saying like, oh my gosh, this has a, like we said, it has a 2.8 million share float. It's a low float. This thing could make a massive move. And in the past, look, we have seen massive moves on this ticker. I know we've had, I've, I've traded it before from four to 12, from four to back to eight, seven, and then from four all the way up to almost nine, and then down here from two all the way up to six. I'm like, okay, this stock's got a 2.8 million float. This thing is gonna rip. Um, however, you know, you look at the volume profile, which is very important, which is the other side of the equation. The float, as we said, was a supply. The volume is our demand, but in quotations, it is our potential demand because we don't exactly know uh, if the volume is going to equate to just straight pure demand in the stock. Is it just gonna go straight up or is there gonna be a lot of sellers contributing to that volume uh, to the sell side? You know, you could have a lot of volume to the short side, a lot of people going short. So it may not exactly um, equate to straight pure demand of going long in a stock. It could be going short as well. So you can't just take also volume at face value and saying, oh my gosh, this stock has huge volume. It's gonna make a big move. Even if there's high volume and if there's a, a, a small float, it doesn't mean that it's gonna go straight up. You know, you have to be able to read the chart after seeing the volume to float ratio as well. So, uh, but first we can just go over just straight, strictly volume. You know, if there's a small float here on, let's say BPTS, it says 2.8 million share float. You know, you might be thinking this may make a big move, but look at the volume. It's pushing about 1,000 shares per one minute candle. This is nothing. This is nothing. You don't want to, you don't want a stock like this. You don't want, um, you don't want to trade something like this because it's not moving. The price is not moving. There's nothing going in. If even if I pull out my tape, look at, there's nothing going through. One, there's one order right there. There's another order. There's another order. You want something that's just going to be flowing down, flowing down the tape, flowing, just absolutely just massive amounts of volume. That's just, it's ticking real fast. You know, you're, you're really starting to develop a nice pattern. Um, and, um, actually something that's tradable right here. You know, you can't really trade something like this. Um, if you are, you gotta be looking for a long hold time because of the, how slow, it's moving. You want something that's uh, moving definitely a lot faster uh, than that. So volume is very important because it acts as our potential demand. Um, and without volume, you can't really trade it um, because you're going to get something like this, a little ping pong effect. Um, similar with, you know, if you look at other stocks that are now out of play, um, you know, DRUG, Okay, there's no volume on this. This is this is a, a low flow, and you may you know analyze the daily chart and be like, oh my God, it sold off so much. We could be able to get a bounce back to two dollars and twenty five cents, but you know it's not tradable. It's not tradable. You don't want to be trading this. There's zero volume. There's nobody's trading this. Small cap traders focus on the on the stocks that are have the news headline every single morning, which could be different. The stock was gonna be different every single day if you're primarily a short, a small cap, um, a small cap trader, the stock is gonna be different because uh, each stock, um, each stock is uh, reacting to its news catalyst or could be a chart, I guess it could be a chart, um, uh, a chart technical breakout or technical breakdown, but most of the time it's going to be a news catalyst and um, that drives a lot of these movements in these small cap stocks. So a lot of the stocks are just going to be different every single day. And the ones that fall away, you know, eventually the volume is going to start to dissipate. You don't want to trade those anymore. You want to focus on the stocks that everyone is looking at every single day and that's going to be different. <clears throat> um, small caps tend to just come into the limelight come into the, the spotlight 
uh, for just you know one day or two days or three days. Occasionally, you'll get one for like a couple weeks, um, and then they fall away. The volume starts to dissipate, and it's no longer really tradable. Um, so you always want to kind of keep up with the with the trend, I guess you could say, uh, keeping up with um, you know the theme of the markets or keeping up with the latest breaking news in the small cap realm because that's what's going to be driving um, a lot of the moves and that's where the volume is going to be so you want to be following something you know that's starting to get high volume see now this is starting to become tradable we just had a nice candle with about almost a hundred thousand shares uh, <clears throat> being able to be traded so now it's going to be like now this is on my radar now this is a tradable now we're starting to potentially make a move it could potentially make a move and it's a little bit more liquid. If you're taking bigger size, you might not take as much slippage. Down here, if you own more than a thousand shares, you could be taking slippage. And slippage means that you want to sell. Let's say you buy at a dollar and twenty. You want to sell at a dollar twenty-two. There might not be a thousand shares. If you own a thousand shares, they might. There might not be a thousand shares that are on the offer to, at one twenty-two. And so you'll take out, let's say, whatever's there at 122, you'll take out 250 shares at, let's say, 122, and now you're trying to sell at 121, and now only for a one cent profit, there's only, let's say, 500 shares available there. Um, you take out that, and now you're selling break even for the rest, uh, all because you know there's just not enough volume in the stock. Okay, so like we said, BPTS is starting to get a little bit of volume. See, now look at the tape. The tape is completely different than what we were seeing just a moment before. And so this is what we mean about a little bit more volume, especially in conjunction with that low flow, could really drive a move. Um, so we had 126 up to 140. That's a 10% move. That's, a, that's, enough, that's enough to make your day right there. If you could have just bought into this, you know, higher volume candle, you know, anticipating demand, um, you could be up pretty decent on the day. So that's what we mean about the uh, float to volume ratio, as well as, you know, making sure we're picking that stock that is um, gapping up every single day uh, in relation to either a news catalyst or a technical breakout or, you know, setting up our scanner as well uh, to capturing those low floats, which we will uh, dive in on later in this course um, but yeah um, so volume is our potential demand that can fuel the move float is kind of setting the stage it's kind of our supply um, if we have limited supply and a high volume on the day caused by any sort of technical breakout or uh, news catalyst we could see um, a huge influx in demand uh, for potential buyers of the stock and that could um, drive the ratio from uh, su supply and demand to cause the stock to make a decent move so that's important volume is just as important as float and learning how to read the volume is very very important in order to know what is tradable and what is not tradable before this is not tradable, very not, not much tradable as unless you're really looking for a longer hold time. Um, and even then, you know, volume may never come in into now a tradable stock because we have that now volume to trade off of. Uh, especially if you're taking bigger size, it'll be easier to get in and out of the stock. Um, <clears throat> so next, we're going to be understanding our chart patterns, reading a daily chart, etc. Uh, so stay tuned for that. All right, so for this episode, we're going to talk about daily charts, and we're going to also talk about chart patterns. Yes, my hairstyle has changed since the last video. Don't be alarmed. Uh, but yeah, today we're going to go over our chart patterns, pretty much basic chart patterns um, that you should probably already understand um, now um as a beginner uh, also you're going to be learning about daily charts which is a little bit more uh, of a skill set that you have to develop over uh, a period of time of really starting to understand <clears throat> what to look for on the daily chart in order to read the potential of the stock on the day so let's just go into here's a daily chart of ebet 
Specifically, this one made a decent move back in February, but uh, first let's go over just our basic chart pattern just as a refresher. So, you know, you have your uh, head and shoulder pattern, you have your um, kind of ranging pattern, and then a breakout of the range or a breakdown of the range. Here's your pennant or your sort of your flag pattern. Here's more of a different sort of flag pattern. Um, so you can get kind of different different variations of the flag. You know, some flags will do a low, uh, a lower low and then a higher low before breaking out or breaking down if it turns out to be a false breakout. Uh, or you'll have a, uh, a low here and then a lower low and a reclaim and a breakout. Uh, here's your bear flag. Here is your flat top breakout. So very similar. This is very similar to a bull flag or your regular flag or your pennants. However, um, you have more resistance showing at the high here, which uh, price is kind of forming a flat top until it does finally break out. Here's your double bottom uh, reversal pattern, and here's your double top reversal pattern. So there's also a bunch of other patterns that you can you know, take a look at. Uh, this is very similar as well. Um, yeah, so there's a bunch of chart patterns that um, you should be familiar with when you're getting into trading. It's very basic, you know, knowledge of those that you need. However, they are not a foolproof strategy. It's not, uh, the pattern is not the strategy when it comes to learning a profitable uh, trading strategy. It's more so a guide to help you pinpoint entries and exits on the chart. It's not so much as this is a bull flag I must buy, or this is a reversal pattern, so it has to reverse. Um, it really, there's a whole other element to having those chart patterns actually um, work out in the favor of the direction that you're looking for. So if you're looking for a reversal pattern, it really has to line up with other aspects of the chart. There has to be multi-time frame alignment. The sentiment has to be there. Um, all of those other things coming to factor of whether or not that chart or that um, pattern is going to result in what you expect it will be. So uh, a lot of the times you'll get chart patterns that, you know, they look like they're going to be a head and shoulders pattern. It's going to reverse. And it turns out that, you know, once it gets back to the, back to the low, we can uh, pull up that head and shoulders again. Uh, so here's your head and shoulders. So it really depends on market sentiment and other aspects of the chart um, and the level two as well that you want to be looking at. Uh, but these are really good, you know, for entries and, and stop losses. Um, a good guide, on uh, you know, pinpointing that entry. So, you know, you might see in, in some strong markets, you might see this sort of pattern that is turning out to be, you know, a reversal and you might want to get in short or you might want to scalp like these bounces off the support level on the on the neckline. But if the market is really strong, what you might find is that this stock may come right back down here to kind of finish this pattern and you might expect it to dump lower. But, um, you know, it only pushes this neckline lower uh, a couple cents before reversing and going right back up to the highs and squeezing out anyone who thought this was going to be a reversal pattern. So it really depends on the sentiment of that stock. Is this, does the stock have a strong news? Um, is the daily chart, is there any sort of gaps or windows on the daily chart, uh, which we're going to go over? Uh, is it a blue sky setup? Is it a sentiment, a market sentiment where recently a bunch of stocks have been going two or 300 or more percent on the day? And this pattern's only uh, this pattern showing itself on only like 25% or 50% on the day. You know, there's definitely a lot of factors to bring in uh, when evaluating whether or not that pattern is actually going to result or resolve in the way that you want to. So, all right, so let's jump in real quick to uh, get a nice understanding of daily charts. So. Reading a daily chart can definitely be tricky at times, but it's definitely something that you need to know when you're getting into day trading. So first things first is you pretty much read it kind of similar the way you would re read a intraday chart. 
And the daily chart's important because sometimes you can't really tell on the, on the intraday chart whether or not if there's upside resistance or if there's no resistance. So the thing we wanna look at is potential upside resistance and also historical price action. So if we take a look at some of these daily charts of stocks that are in play today, we have EBET uh, that was moving today. But if you look at the daily chart, the trend is going down and every time it pops up, it flushes back down. That is usually a sign that every time that is going to pop up, it is very likely that it's going to dump right back lower. And that's how you should treat trading that intraday pattern. Since none of these stocks, uh, since this stock does not hold up, uh, you wouldn't want to be the one bag holding as it's entering the backside. Um, so EBIT had a nice move here, but quickly dumped. And then also here we had a little bit, uh, a gap, and then we faded on uh, here, a gap and faded, gap and faded. So that seems to be the trend with this stock. And so <clears throat> by looking at this, you can kind of predict the movement of the, <clears throat> of the price action as it goes, uh, as it moves along intraday. So you might have a big move in the morning and then the rest of the day it starts to fade. Uh, so that's something that you should keep in mind when trading something like this. And a lot of the small cap stocks are like this. Um, you have a really big move and then it does fade and doesn't really hold up. Uh, but occasionally you'll get that one stock every now and then that does hold up and you get uh, that multi-day continuation. So <clears throat> that's also something you want to look at. Some stocks will have that multi-day continuation. Another thing we can look at is gaps and windows. So gaps and windows, we can also look at blue sky setups and IPOs, um, which are all pretty much uh, similar. And what I'm about to explain is you want to look for areas of no resistance or no prior trading history that will be very important in analyzing a daily chart. So for example, in this area, there's no trading history. So that means that there's no one who owns any shares in this area. And so there's no area of resistance or support in this area since nobody is looking to buy or sell because they do not own those shares. Anyone who's looking to buy or sell in that area is, has owned shares from either a higher point or a lower point in the stock. Also, blue sky setups are very important to identify because if you do get a blue sky setup, that means there's no resistance to the upside. That means there's nobody who owns that stock any higher than it was previously, which means that everybody, everyone who is long the stock is green. And we know uh, greed is part of that index of fluctuating in the emotion in the stock market. And if we have a blue sky setup, it's very likely that you'll get that um, push all the way to the greed, extreme greed index um, side of the equation. And you'll get a huge move um, just from sheer momentum since that everyone is winning in that particular stock at that time. Uh, so here we got a move from $38 all the way up to $79.80 because there was no upside resistance. There was nobody who was bag holding this stock from a higher price and looking to sell their position uh, to push the price lower. So we did get a huge, nice move on EBIT. So that's an example of a blue sky setup right here. Uh, and timing this breakout would be key for the blue sky um, strategy or the, the blue sky setup trade that you'd want to take. Uh, but those don't come along every day. Uh, only every once in a while you get a blue sky setup. IPOs are the same way. IPO, uh, there's no previous uh, price action history. So that means there's no support and no resistance, which means that you can get highly volatile moves on an IPO, which is why traders love to trade them. Uh, but, you know, it's high risk, high reward. There's low, there's no upside resistance and there's also no support to the downside so you definitely got to be careful with ipos but yeah it's the same uh reasoning as blue sky setups is that there's no previous trading history uh so no support or, res or no resistance and no support for the ipo um we can go and look at uh ebet not ebet uh g r o m which this will explain a, another example of um, a window. So a window is, like we said, 
sorry, no, a gap is an area of no previous price action history. So there was price action history in this area. Uh, if you look on the 180 day chart, so there was some um, price action history. So this is considered actually a window. A window is where there was price action history, but um, it did move, uh, it did not form any sort of support on the chart. So there's no support or resistance because price did not consolidate in this area. So that also could be a sign that there's very little resistance in that area. And so as some of these stocks sometimes curl back up, to retest the starting area or the the low of the beginning of that window and if you break into that window we could have a, a quick move to fill that window which would be all the way up to 450 uh, which would be that previous previous support which is now acts as a resistance area so that's why it's important to to recognize these because it can provide an opportunity because you can get that curl and we could fill that window, which there was pre previously no resistance uh, or minimum price action history to form any sort of resistance in that area of the chart. And then similarly, if you look at uh, this stock here, uh, right here, this is an example of this is an example of a gap. So you can clearly see the gap here, all the way from 560 up to around 760. So a two dollar gap which there was no previous price action history. So that's very important to recognize from one day, it was 760 a share. The next day it was 550 a share. And if we can recognize that on this day here, any traders who are trading this stock, AUPH was curling up to retest this last candle at 561. And if you can catch that break of 561, which is that, that previous high, before the, the gap fill, you could completely capitalize on this move from 560 all the way up to the previous candle, which now acts as resistance uh, up to 750. So that's another example of the gap fill. And again, these are just, these are just kind of guides to kind of recognize potential opportunities in the market. They're not so much a specific strategy to trade, but yes, there are guides and in the right market sentiment, you can be able to look at a leading gapper with hot, hot volume, fresh news. And if you can recognize a gap or window in the chart, you can capitalize that and make a decent profit on the day with that. So that's a quick understanding of daily charts as well as basic chart patterns, um, which they should come in handy throughout your trading journey. So next we're gonna go over reading the market sentiment and why that's important as well. So stay tuned. All right, so let's go over here lesson five, reading market sentiment is so, so important. This is probably one of the most important lessons and it's gonna be in this course here, reading market sentiment and it's so important because that's how you're gonna know um, the risk off versus risk on environments. And traders who do not get this, traders who aren't able to dial in and understand market sentiment, they always, they always, always, always get into huge, huge drawdowns in a risk off environment. Right now, as of uh, recording this, October, 2023, lately the past month has been a risk off environment. But those traders who aren't, aren't able to understand um, risk off versus risk on environments, they are suffering severe, severe drawdowns because they are, are not able to dial it back. They're not able to dial back um, their size. They're not able to be a little bit more picky, a little bit more selective with their setups. Um, that's what you should be doing in a risk off environment when the market sentiment is weak, when the market sentiment is hot, you should be pressing on the gas. You should be doubling down, tripling down your share size. You should be getting a little bit more lenient with A, a plus setups versus B setups. Maybe you should be start taking a, a couple more B setups rather than just waiting for those A plus setups, which you would do in a risk off environment, because a lot of these times the B, the B setups are gonna work just as well as the A setups. Um, so you get a little bit more of a wiggle room when it comes to um, taking trades in a hot hotter market or a, a better 
a risk on environment or better market sentiment. So it's very important to understand that. And that's how you're going to be able to adjust your aggressive to being aggressive to being more passive, having bigger share size versus smaller share size. And that'll be able to protect your account in weak markets. And you'll be able to grow your account and exponentially grow it in a hot market. And so that's what you really want to figure out that balance uh, with the market. Uh, when it's a risk off environment, you want to, you know, tighten it up a little bit. You know, if you can just go sideways, go sideways, you know, a little green, little red, little green, little red. That's perfect. That's fine in a risk off environment. You want to really, you know, tighten it up. And then when it's a risk on environment, you really want to just expand your, your share size, be a little bit more open with other opportunities in the market, maybe trading more, trading longer in the day, sizing up. Um, and being a little bit more lenient in your setups. Um, and uh, you can really grow your portfolio uh, in those uh, certain periods of time. I remember when I first started getting into trading about three and a half years ago, uh, I was listening to this guy, Stang Lucci, and I didn't know, like, I was listening to a story, like he was make, he made millions and then he lost it all. And then he said there's some guys like working, he, he saw some guys working at, um, uh, I don't know, some rest, some Chipotle, not Chipotle. It was, I don't know. They saw him working, saw a guy blow up and then they went back to working as a server at some restaurant. And he like saw them there. It's like, wow, like these guys just had no risk management. Um, and they just, right when the market flipped from risk on to risk off, they completely blew up. And I remember him saying that, um, you know, wait for your market, be patient, wait for your market. And when it's your market, than guns blazing. And at the time I was like, I was like, what does that even mean? Like, what does it mean to be my market? Um, I had no idea what that meant. I was like, well, every market's my market. What does that even, like, I didn't know what that meant. And that was the one thing that kind of turned around my trading to before I would, you know, make a little bit, make a little bit, make a little bit, make a little bit. And the market got cold for a day. I would lose it all in one day. And that was, that was my theme for. Um, that was my theme for uh, most of my uh, early career, and I know a lot of traders are struggling with that. With you know having a nice solid stretch, a nice couple of weeks of green, um, and then for one or two days to give it all back. That seems to be a trend for beginner traders, and um, the reason that is is because you're not able to dial it back in a slower market. You're not able to um, take your risk off when you need to take your risk off. You're not able to recognize that market. And that's important to be able to stay alive long term. So there's a couple things we want to take a look at when you're reading market sentiments. Um, you want to look at uh, your pre-market gappers. Are there a lot of pre-market gappers that are over 50% on the day, over 100% on the day? Um, they have high volume pre-market and they have a news catalyst. That's going to be a good sign that there's going to be a lot more volatility on the day. Um, also, looking back to previous days, a lot of people like to say that each day is its own. You know, in a way, it is. You should be approaching each day as its own. As its own. But um, previous, the most recent previous history in the market, say a couple days prior, if there has been a lot of runners just straight out of the gates or pre-market they just can just going straight up and they're making a massive move uh, there's definitely more likely for the next day to have another stock to do that because traders um you know if they miss the first one they like to jump on the second one because they don't want to miss out and um you know we're all susceptible to fear and greed in the market and these small caps uh, it's a lot of actual uh uh, traders who are uh, not algo trading, they're actually you know point and click type of traders. They're discretionary traders uh, in the small cap realm. So a lot of us, you know, we tend to um, be influenced by fear and greed. And so when you see a stock that just goes straight up 200, 300 percent, we're already looking on our charts for the next one. We want to we want to catch the next one and be the first one on that next stock that runs. So if there is a stock that runs previously a day or two prior, you should definitely be a little bit more keen on looking for the next one that's going to make that big move. Um, 
So that could definitely contribute to a hotter market sentiment. And then sometimes we'll get days where, you know, back between 2020 to 2022, we'd have days where three or four stocks were just all in play at once. And it's really hard to kind of keep track of all, all, all of those setups. Uh, it was just setup after setup after setup after setup. And that is definitely a sign that you're, we're in, that we would be in a super, super hot market. And that's when you'd want to really press on the gas. Um, another thing you can look at is themes. Um, there's a lot of themes in the market. Uh, you know, recently we had a theme of AI stocks or any stock that had anything to do with artificial intelligence or chat GPT was going up 100%. Um, so that's another thing to keep aware of. Also stocks, you know, price, like a price is another theme. Sometimes penny stocks are all in theme for like a week. Anything under a dollar is, or the stocks that are sort of gapping up and moving uh, on news or anything, you know, higher price stocks, $20 stocks, you know, sometimes we'll get um, a couple days of where it's just like only stocks over $10 that are moving or electric vehicles, you know, sometimes you'll get EV stocks or battery stocks that are all moving at once. Uh, so sectors are definitely something to, to pay attention to. Also IPOs, you know, sometimes we'll just get a lot of action on IPOs when there's a nice string of IPOs coming through. Oil stocks. So you know, there's a lot of things um, that could, that you could keep paying attention to to really identify a theme in the market. Not all the time there is a theme, but uh, sometimes when it is a hotter market, you'll be able to kind of identify what's driving the hot market. And it will be centered around a theme mostly. It could be a theme around the news. It could be a theme around the price. It could be a theme around um, you know specific patterns even. Um, it could be a theme around the sector. Or the type of news, like I said, like a phase three catalyst or phase two catalysts or, you know, biotechs or EVs or banking stocks, um, tech stocks, a lot of tech stocks as well. Um, so, you know, definitely pay attention to that and you can definitely be able to kind of pinpoint exactly what's driving the hot market when the hot market comes in. And then you can be, you know, a little bit more focused on those types of stocks, um, you know, early in the day in the pre-markets. You know, waiting for that stock to really set up, and you know, if you know you, if you know that those types of stocks have made a big move the previous day or two, uh, you could really dial in on one of those setups and be a little bit more confident that it's going to work out because of you being able to identify the theme. So it's it really is a mixture between kind of feeling the market, you know, the volume, um, the gappers. You know, is there a lot of volatility? Are the setups actually you know, holding up and they are, are they still ripping another 50% and then holding again and keep going? That is definitely a sign that we're in a hot market. Uh, so a lot of it is feel. Also, a lot of it is, you know, analyzing the news catalyst, analyzing the theme between the price, uh, the price of the stocks or the sector. Um, so a lot of things that, to take into account when reading market sentiment, but it's so, so important if you want to be um, a successful trader long term because there's, we're going to go through markets and periods where it's really hot and you really, really want to double down on growing your share size and your portfolio can make, you know, 50, 100 percent in just like a month um, in a hot market. Then also you're going to experience markets where it's going to be really cold. You're going to want to really dial it in, be really selective on your um, setups that you want to trade. You want to really dial in, uh, really pull back the share size because you don't want to put on too much risk um, on some of these on some of these days where it's a risk off environment to protect your account. And some of those months you're only going to maybe be break even. You might be small red, you might be small green, and that's okay. And that's going to be you know, a success. You're going to be able to look at it as a success because the opportunity that were given on those months were just so uh, weak. There wasn't many. And to walk away break even would be a success uh, and would be a huge gain in the account. Uh, but then again, you know, when the market shifts back to hot, that's when you're going to want to be able to pivot quick and start to put on risk again. So uh, it's definitely it's definitely very tricky to kind of read that, but it's going to be a very very invaluable skill to learn. So um, that's it for reading market sentiment. Next, we're going to go over uh, market indicators and understanding market indicators. 
All right, so now we're gonna go over the market indicators. Now, market indicators are very, very helpful when it comes to trading. However, <clears throat> a lot of beginner traders like to overdo it, like I did. I did, I overdo, I overdid my uh, market indicators. <coughs> it looked a whole like a lot of pile of spaghetti. This is what it kind of looked like when I first started trading. Uh, that was my uh, chart and didn't really do much for me. I actually got more of a paralysis by analysis rather than getting more information about the stock or the setup for me to actually take the trade. A lot of times what happens is I was just a whole lot less confident in the trade and it would completely mess up about uh, you know my entries and my exits and as well as you know what setup to take because there's so many conflicting, so much conflicting information when you have so much indicators. So um, what I did was kind of just drop it all, um, started naked trading for a while, um, and then it wasn't until I added VWAP and the moving averages to really help me kind of um, dial in on my trading and my setups. And a lot of traders like to use these moving averages, which is why I like to use them, because if everybody's using them, then the, the moving average and the VWAP would be more valid. You know, it would hold up its... It would hold up its name. It would hold up a, the price on on that level. It would be more respectable at that level um, when price hits it. And so that's why you should use them is because everybody uses them. Um, so it's more likely to be respected on these stocks. So for example, the blue line here is my nine EMA. Uh, that's my nine EMA moving averages, which is pretty much the average price of the stock over the course of the past nine candles. Here, the purple is the 20 EMA, and that is the average price of the last 20 candles. And my VWAP is the average price um, volume weighted over the course of the day. So the average price on the day, volume weighted. So candles with more volume are gonna have more weight to the price or to the VWAP, the price of the VWAP is at, than the candles with lower volume. So for example, this high area of volume, this carried the VWAP way up here because of the high volume. This area here, very low volume, so it really didn't have much effect on the VWAP. Um, so it kind of um, leveled out around 110. And you can even see that it's well respected. You can see after, well you can see first, the dip to the VWAP, it held up, so there's still demand around this area. Traders are respecting it, and it ripped up. And then also, when it came back down, it may have broke back down. Maybe there wasn't enough buyers here to hold this up uh, initially. However, underneath, we had some buyers to retest the VWAP, and then shorts pushing it back down, or buyers selling their position, pushing it back down, respecting this level um, to the downside. Then also you have over here uh, another retest of VWAP uh, again and still a lot of shares to be sold into um, which pushing it back down so it did respect this level here as well and then also here again quick bounce off of VWAP uh, so VWAP is very um, respected amongst traders discretionary traders uh, which is definitely something you want to have in your arsenal uh, the 9 EMA as well as you can bring it to the five minute chart as well, just as respectable on the five minute as on the one minute, actually sometimes even more cleaner. You see you got that retest here, you got a retest there, and we got a retest on that candle and in this candle here. Um, the 9 EMA, you know, just as respected as, as you can see, kind of price riding the 9 EMA and that's what you'll kind of see um on front side stocks so a lot of the front side stocks they just love to ride the 9 ema and that's why a lot of traders like to you know put in a position as price retest the 9 ema and as it extends off the 9 ema they sell the position when it comes back to retest you rebuy and then you sell on the extension on the retest you buy and you sell it on the extension you know it's very easy to see hindsight <clears throat> versus in the moment, but um, the 9 EMA can definitely give you a little bit more confidence in buying the dips because you know that traders are respecting the 9 EMA. 
Um, so on the one minute, it's not as much clear, but you know, still you had a bounce here. You had you know price riding in this area, um, price riding in this area. There wasn't much volume here on this stock pre-market, um, but yeah, uh, 90 EMA is well respected. Definitely something you also want to have. Uh, the 20 EMA is is similar. You know, you kind of similarly read it as the 90 EMA. However, just on you know a wider scale, you know it still rides 20 EMA. Traders still respect it. Um, and it's kind of just what I use it as sort of like a gray zone. So, you know, a lot of the times you see price dip down below the 90 EMA, but it holds. You see that? You see all these wicks down. So I kind of use the 20 as a buffer zone because a lot of times, you know, price will come back below in the same candle below the 90 EMA to reclaim it. And if you're buying right at the 90 EMA and it comes down a couple of cents, you know, you could be taking a small loss when it actually price closes above the 90 EMA. So I kind of use the 20 as sort of a buffer. You know, I can allow the price to come down a little bit, but if it starts to break down the 20 EMA, that's when it starts to be like, okay, we might be entering a backside move. So that's when you want to be able to uh, manage your risk, maybe sell some of your position for a break even or a small loss, and then look for another setup. So that's what I kind of use the 20 EMA for. It's kind of like a buffer zone when I'm trying to buy the dip off the 90 EMA. For example, look at here. You could, this would be a perfect setup, buying off the 90 EMA, but let's say you were a little early. Let's say you bought at 112, it comes down to 109, a little over 109, but you're holding 20 EMA. So I kind of use that as a gray zone as far as you know a buffer zone of buying the dip. You know, I could I could hold three cents lower. I, I could totally uh, hold three cents lower that is you know fine on the risk management side um, but I'd want to see you know price reclaim that 9 EMA relatively shortly uh, which it did here and it would have turned out to be a green trade but if you see that price breaks the 9 EMA and you're immediately selling you could be taking a loss um, you could be taking a loss when you didn't need to uh, but then again you know if it breaks and it just completely just destroys the nine and the 20, you know, you definitely wanna be selling um, and not holding into that, um, that flush down. And that went all the way down to $1. Uh, it did reclaim, but um, it did reclaim, but not something you wanna be holding from. If you're buying the nine EMA around 110 to 111, you don't wanna be holding all the way back down to 99 cents. That is just poor, poor risk management. That is more than 10% loss um, in a trade. It's just not something you wanna be doing uh, for risk management. Uh, but the traders who did, you know, they got lucky and that's, that's very rare for that to happen. It's very rare for that to happen. Um, and again, here you kinda of got that test of the 90 EMA, didn't quite get that pop. And then we got the breakdown there. Um, so. 90 EMA, 20 EMA, and VWAP, it's really kind of all you need. You don't want to put, you don't want to do too many indicators because you can get that paralysis by analysis. And it's really just to kind of aid you in, you know, managing your risk. Also looking at potential areas where there could be demand or potential supply to sell into. Um, and you should be really using your level two the depth of market, which is what we will go over next um, to really pinpoint uh, if you should be taking the entry or if you should be selling your position. So you can kind of use, you know, your setups, you can kind of use your uh, VWAP and your moving averages to kind of aid you at looking at potential areas of where there could be some buyers or where there could be some sellers, if there's resistance or if there's support in that specific area. For example, you know, it could be some support here, could be some support here, uh, there could be some supply here, it could be or resistance here. And then you want to be looking at your depth of market to be able to kind of verify that and get that confirmation to either buy or sell at that specific area. Um, so that's kind of how you want to look at the moving averages and VWAP. You don't want to just blindly buy, okay, price is at the VWAP, price is at 90 EMA, just blindly buy. You know, that is not the setup. The setup is in the depth of market. The setup is in the level two. You want to be looking for signs of buyers, big bids. You want to look at, you know, movements in the tape and the level two to indicate that there's either buyers or sellers. And that's what we'll go over next. 
uh, reading the depth of market. So stay tuned for that. All right, so now we're going to talk about the depth of market. Depth of market is also very, very important when it comes to trading because that's how you're going to be able to pinpoint the exact entry and exit, uh, when to enter and when to exit a stock. Um, that's where you're going to read, be able to read momentum in the stock. That's where you're going to be able to read the buyers and the sellers, the supply and the demand of the stock. And within that given setup, You'll be able to capitalize and buy at the right moment and time it perfectly to be able to capture a move. So uh, there's a couple things to be aware of in the depth of market. First, there is level two, and then there is tape. So first, uh, let's take a look at Thinkorswim's uh, level two, uh, which is all you really need. Um, Thinkorswim's level two is all you really need to be a profitable trader. A lot of traders have made it just using Thinkorswim. Um, it does get the job done, uh, but um, I am finding that there's a couple things that you're at a little bit of a disadvantage from, but it doesn't mean that you can't be profitable using this. So don't feel that you need to buy any sort of paid level two or paid market data. Um, Thinkorswim offers very, very good depth of market. Uh, here is your active trader ladder. So pretty much this is what I use for my level two. Um, I don't like the actual level two window or level two montage on Thinkorswim. Um, I just don't think it's very visually appealing. So what I did was I used the Thinkorswim ladder, which is pretty much the level two just in vertical format. Um, then also right here we have our tape. So tape is just the orders coming through. As um, the buy and sell orders are going through in the market, they are all gonna appear here. Everything has already been executed. These are the orders that are yet to be executed. So these are the orders on the buy side, on the bid. These are the orders on the sell side are the ask. So this would be um, the best price uh, willing, the highest price willing to be to, to buy the stock, this is the lowest price to be able to sell the stock. And then this is where um, buyers and sellers meet in the middle here. Um, so let's take a look at some of these uh, setups that I have pulled out of my day trading archives, uh, just so you can get a little bit of feel on the level two action um, and what you should be looking at. Uh, on the level two to pinpoint a good entry. So here we have CFRX. This one was the gapper on the morning. Uh, so we had like a nice flagging pattern on larger time frames. Uh, we did get a break out of this range running up to high a day. We kissed 299 right below the psychological resistance, which is usually whole and half dollars are psychological resistance or psychological support. So in this case, the $3 is going to be psychological resistance. And that is because um, a lot of traders like to put their stops. A lot of pe people try to put their um, their buy orders. Uh, and they like to put you know limit orders right around the whole dollar. Uh, it's just a psychological level that um, discretionary traders like to look at uh, when it comes to buying and selling. So CFRX kissed $3 and pulled back. So this would be... A good setup, uh, you know, we're entering a fun front side move right below a whole dollar, um, whole dollar breakout. And so really what you want to look for here is a dip. Um, if you could have gotten in on the low here or on, in the 80s or timing the break of $3. And so in this case, I do attempt to try, try the break of $3. And what I'm looking for is I'm looking right here at the level two, and I want to be able to time this break of $3 and sell as soon as it breaks the whole dollar. So here you can see the level two, and maybe I should s slow it down. Playback speed, let's do a quarter. So you're going to see, you know, a huge block of sellers right here at $3. This is your psychological resistance. And in order to time that, you want to be looking at the level two. And that's why it's so important, because if you see something like this, you're going to want to be able to jump on board as it's chewing away that level. 
and buying into that momentum to get that nice pop and we pop up to 306. Uh, you can see all of those buyers that jumped in as they saw those that big sell order get chewed up. So even goes up to 314. I'm in 600 shares there, take a nice profit there. Um, so you can see in a hot market, this is definitely a hotter market. In a hot market, when you get that psychological resistance level, it can really act as a like a floodgate. You know, when there's buyers in the market, um, you know, you have for fresh catalysts on a low float stock, something like this on CFRX, um, the whole dollar is going to act like a barrier. It's going to act like the flood, the floodgates. And when you see a big sell order right at three dollars and it starts to get chipped away, it slowly, slowly starts to break down and break down and break down until boom, the gates open and the buyers just flood in. The water just floods in, and you get a nice huge pop. And so that's something you're going to be able to recognize on the level two, and that's what you want to use in order to pinpoint that exact timing to be able to um, catch that move. Um, a lot of people like to do is anticipate that as well. You know, you could be getting in on the dip here. Um, you could be getting in on the dip down here at 280. Um, and then, you know, anticipating a $3 break and holding it a little bit longer. However, when you're in a colder market, um, you know, sometimes this may not go back up to three. It may start to fade. So that's why you kind of have to read that market sentiment and then also, you know, manager risk to the downside so maybe you take a starter position and then maybe you add into that confirmation for the whole dollar breakout so this is what i kind of did i took 100 shares at 290 because i had my thesis i'm like okay this looks good for the break of three we have the momentum in the market we have sentiment in the market and as it starts to come up to three i add 500 shares and catch a quick 10 cents or more than that um, and that was a really nice quick easy profit well I wouldn't say easy not always easy um, and again you know in a colder market uh, you might not get such a clean move like this so uh, but it's very important to be able to look at that level two um, the tape uh, the tape is I didn't really use much of the tape uh, in thinkorswim I just found that it wasn't as fluid as what I get right now with the paid market data but again you know a lot of traders have made it to profitable status um, using Fingerswim, so I would not, you know, not I would not uh, say that you're at a huge disadvantage. But as you can see, the level two is just not that uh, fluid as far, or well, the tape is not as fluid as far as some of these paid market data, which you will see in a second um, in some of these other reviews that we're going to do. Uh, I do have uh, DOS level two, which is definitely a huge difference in what you're about to see in the level two data, just in the fluidity and being able to feel the market. It feels like the connection, your connection with the market is a little bit closer than what you'd get here. And so you can kind of feel the pulse of the market a little bit more um, and a little bit more clearer than what you'd have with, uh, with this here at Think or Swim. But uh, this does by no means say that um, you can't be profitable in Think or Swim. A lot of traders have. Me, personally, I have became profitable using Think or Swim. And then after so long of using Think or Swim, I'm finding um, scaling up um, with scaling up with bigger share size, I'm just a lot more comfortable um, paying for market data because I could get in the return from that better market data will be you know, a lot better a lot more worth it than if I was just trading small size on Think or Swim, because uh, the better information you can get, the faster information you can get in the level two depth of market, the faster you'll be able to make decisions and the faster you'll be able to get in and out of the stock and beat the other traders that are trying to get in before you before the big move. So we're also trying to get out before the big dump. So. Uh, market data is very, very important. It's like your inf information, information. You've got to be able to read it faster than any everyone else, especially if you're a scalper, in order to get there first. Um, because as you could see, that break of three dollars, there was only there was 30,000 30, shares at there was thirty thousand shares uh, at three dollars. Uh, let's try to get that here. 
Oh, oh. okay. Well, there's 21,000, but there was 33,000 shares here just a second ago. So there's only 30,000 shares available at $3. If, you're, if your data is not fast enough, if you're not getting the information fast enough, you're not going to be able to get in here as fast as everybody else, and you're going to be the one sending your market orders and getting filled at the high after the pop. And that's what you don't want because uh, some of these times when it does break out, it'll reverse right back down and you can be the one holding the bag in a halt down, taking a massive loss. So uh, market data is super important. You got to be the one, you know, being able to analyze that and getting that data super fast is key to be able to get in for that pop. Uh, because again, you only had a couple seconds to buy there because everyone was seeing it. The first one to the first one to um, first one to the buy button wins, you know, wins the pot there. So it's very, very important to be able to read that and get that information fast enough. Uh, so next we're going to go to another uh, another one here. And for this one. Actually, I still had another one here at 24 minutes. So let's go to 24 minutes. 24. And so this one is an example of whole dollar support now. So first we saw whole, the whole dollar, $3 as resistance. Now we're looking at it for support. And we want to be able to pinpoint that and locate that on the level two. So here we got a topping tail. It's looking like going to be a false breakout and it comes flashing down. And this is another reason why I don't like thinkorswim because look, I can't even see the level two. It's another reason why I dropped think the thinkorswim market data, but um, for a free resource, it is still really good. But yeah, I, I can't even see the level two here. But here, this is an example of the whole dollar support. 41,000 shares at $3. If you see this, you're going to want to buy at $3 with risking 299 or if you see sellers selling into three dollars and it starts to be chipped away chipped away because that's sort of like your barrier if it starts chipping away chipping away you want to definitely sell into that before it breaks because then it'll come flash flashing back down another 10 or 20 cents um, after that breaks but if you don't see it breaking down you know there's a nice solid bid right there 41,000 shares to hold up that should be your backstop mentally that could be your backstop you have this nice uh, dip here nice 55 cent dip so how many times have you seen a stock crash from 355 down to three dollars and not bounce or not have any sort of uh, retracement you know that's just very rare especially with something with such high volume you're going to be expecting at least some sort of uh, buyers to kind of hold this up after it flashed down 55 cents uh, so this is definitely a volatility setup a volatility scalp um, this is not um, a front side sort of breakout and hold for the front side move. This is something like you want to buy the dip and you know scout for like a quick pop to the upside uh, based on the volatility because it's kind of like a rubber band. Right now the rubber band is stretching out, stretching out 55 cents. That's a lot on a three dollar stock um, and you're going to want to expect some sort of rebound just even just a little bit um, and you'll be able to sell into that pop. You know, after a false breakout like this, I wouldn't be expecting this to come all the way back up to 355. You know, I'd be just wanting to take, you know, a quick 5, 10, or 15 cents off of this. Um, and that's what I do. I think I do take this dip. I'm not exactly sure, but we'll find out. But yeah, you can see that big solid bid there. So what you want to do is, you know, buy off of this level, this psychological level, the whole dollar support. And, you know, if you do start to see that breakdown, selling, selling into that or putting a stop loss at 299. And we do get a rebound a little bit up to 305. It comes right back down to three and it's holding. It starts to chip away a little bit, but it still holds. You got some bids uh, pushing it back up, up to 303, 304. And this is the key with level two reading because you'd be able to pinpoint that. You can't really know that by just looking at the chart. You've got to be looking at the depth of market. And here you go. You get that 15 cent retracement, like that rubber band effect. Um, 
and it does eventually start to come back down and flush through, which we can see. Let's take a look at that in live. Uh, I think we can see that here. Yeah. So we can take a look at that here. And then it finally is still holding a little bit, still holding a little bit. And here it comes down, finally breaks down, and there it goes, another 10 cents lower. I am actually trying to buy the dip there. Yeah, that's a bold to be able to buy that <laughs> to buy that dip. Uh, that wasn't the best the best scalp there, but yeah, as you can see, you know the whole dollar locating that whole dollar support, whole dollar resistance on the level two. It's very important. Uh, it's a very good level. You know, whole dollar, half dollar is a really good level to kind of trade around, either selling into it, um, you know, on an upside swing. You know, if you get that breakout and it rides up to, from three to three fifty, you want to be able to take some off at the half dollar expecting some resistance or if it's coming down into the whole dollar like in this scenario you can buy into a whole dollar as long as you see a nice bid there or yeah as long as you see a nice bid there you can um, buy and put that whole dollar as your psychological stop or hard stop and you'll be able to catch a quick bounce uh, so it's very good to be able to trade around those whole dollars and locate that on the level two um, but yeah, if you don't have that level two, you don't want to be just blindly buying because it's a, a half, it's at the half dollar or if it's at the whole dollar, because not all the time it is going to respect that. You do want to look at the level two uh, to be able to get that confirmation. Uh, so next, let's go to BRSH, um, which is now here is my Dash Trader level two, and you're going to be able to really, really tell the difference just in. The tape and the level two uh, it's just a lot the refresh rate is just super fast it's so fluid I just feel like I have a better pulse in the market and I'm better able to manage my risk better able to scale out of winners be a little bit more confident in what I'm seeing on the level two and tape so here we have uh, BRSA just is on a front side move and then for this case study instead of looking at the level two the bid and the ask I want you to look at the tape, and the tape is very, very important. And now that since we have a, do have a re reliable form of information here on the tape, rather than think or swim, you'll be able to really tell um, the difference between uh, the two. And I want you to look at specifically the speed of the tape, and the speed is going to tell us a lot about what is likely to happen on this trade. So here you have your normal, you know, your normal speed, your normal level two. Uh, this is by by the way, this is normal speed. I'm not at court at a quarter yet, but you want to look at the speed of the tape um, And as it starts to speed up that is showing that a lot of orders are going through a lot of orders are going through And if there's a lot of orders are going through Why is this not dumping? You know if there's so much orders going through as tape is speeding up You know this should be dumping right and if it's not that means that somebody's absorbing all of those sell orders coming through um, so that's always a good sign for a potential bounce. We are in a front side move. We're above the 90 EMA. And we want to look. Uh, we can also look at the tape to be able to identify a potential pivot point uh, for a dip buy or reversal. Uh, because if there's a lot of orders going through, that means there's somebody absorbing all of those orders and soaking them up, soaking them up. So it shows that there's demand below that level. So you can clearly see from here. The speed at right here to uh, right here, it starts to speed up a little bit. No, nope, still kind of the same, still kind of the same. And right, boom, right as, soon it, as soon as it breaks that previous candle, it speeds up. I do buy for a quick pop there. I get back in, and I'm just really waiting for that bounce. It comes down a little lower, and it just scoops right back up. The candle, the candle lifts back up, and the, and the tape... Um, comes through really fast. It shows that there's buyers and there's some demand in that level. And so that can give you a little more confirmation for a potential bounce on this area, especially when you have other factors working in your favor as well. You got the 90 MA right here for potential support. Um, it looks like traders are respecting it. And you have a front side move on high relative volume. And you have the dip. The dip, the red candles are lower in volume than the green candles, which means that um, the sellers are weaker than the buyers at this particular moment. So you can use that in your favor 
as well in order to identify the potential bounce. And we do get that bounce to the upside. And when we do break that previous candle, I am taking my profit there. Uh, and this does actually turn out to be a false breakout. And that tape is really, really speeding up here. Um, really speeding up. And it does turn out to be a false breakout. Um, just because the, the tape speeds up does not mean that there is a lot of demand. It could actually mean there's a lot of selling as well. And in this case, on this pop, it means there's a lot of selling. Um, so you want to look at, see that tape is just flying right now. You want to look at the speed of the tape, but also the chart. If the speed of the tape is flying and the price is not moving, um, if it's on an uptrend and the price is not moving, that means that there's somebody soaking to the sell side who's absorbing all those buy orders. If it's on the dip and, this, and the tape is speeding up, that means somebody's soaking on the buy side and absorbing all the sell orders. Uh, and when it's, I think what I said was, if it's going up, the price is going up uh, and it starts to stall out and the tape starts speeding up, that means somebody's soaking all the buy orders and coming down. So um, definitely, you know, there's two ways to look at it. Um, and as well, you know, if the tape is speeding up and the price is just flying up or flying down, that just means that there's just a crap ton of demand and there's actually nobody soaking it. Um, it's actually influencing the price um, tremendously. So that's also something you want to keep in mind. You know, tape starts to speed up here. Somebody's putting out those sell orders and tape starts to just even fly even more as it comes down. And that would have been a really good, right here is a really good volatility dip by anticipating that support holding on the 9 EMA and the 20 EMA, you know, catching a quick 10 cents. And that was actually 15 cents. That was actually a really good trade there. Uh, but yeah, as you can see, you know, the level two and the market data is very important in pinpointing and timing the exact entries and exits, as well as being able to locate exactly if there is demand on where the chart is, you know, if the chart is uh, dipping to the 90 EMA, you don't only you don't only want to blindly buy on the 90 EMA. You also want to look at the level two, the speed of the tape, um, to get that extra confirmation if there's actually buyers in that area or in that zone, and as well as when the price is spiking to the upside, um, is there any huge selling or any you know. Is the price not moving up higher anymore and the speed of the tape is still flying? I mean, somebody could be you know, uh, soaking all those buy orders and looking to reverse the chart. Or is there any blocks of sellers at whole dollars or half dollars? That could also be very good levels to trade around, either selling into or buying into for a potential breakout. So those are very important uh, things to keep aware of when you are trading. Um, it can definitely go a long way. This is actually the main thing that you should be looking at when you are trading. Um, you don't want to primarily look at the chart. You actually want to primarily look at the level two and the tape and <clears throat> using kind of the chart as uh, the roadmap. It should be sort of the roadmap, but you know, with buying and selling, you want to be looking at the level two and the tape <coughs> when you are entering and exiting the market. Um, and also you can tell, you know, that the spread of the stock is also important. You can get that through the level two. Um, and then also if you get, if you pay for extra market data, you can get um, the, the limit up and limit down, which is the halt level. So you can get that as well. You can get the halt resumption price. Those are also key factors or key information that you can get if you do upgrade from um, TOS to a paid market data uh, platform. So very important, the depth of markets. Uh, next, we're going to talk about your journaling, screen recording, and generally how to read your statistics and your metrics uh, and um, how you can use that to improve your trading as well. So stay tuned for that. All right, now for journaling your trade. So journaling is very, very important as well. A lot of professional, successful traders, profitable traders, every successful trader journals their trades. Um, it's very, very important if you want to improve as a trader because what you don't measure, 
What you don't track, you don't know how to improve, you don't know if you're improving, you don't know what to do to improve. So that's why it's very, very important. So here is Trade Journal, which is, um, this has a free journaling platform. Um, you've obviously watching this, this course, this lesson on Trade Journal. Uh, well, it does have a built-in free analytic software, which is super, super valuable, completely free. You can upload your trades straight from your broker and you can analyze your trades and pretty much has everything that you'd really need. So here's an example of one of my days and let's just jump into the metrics and uh, understand what we're looking at uh, when we uh, import and analyze our trades. So what we have here is you know, our total winners, our total losses, net profit, profit margin, which is pretty much your um, total losses divided by your winnings. So came about 70% on this day of my profits. Um, total winners, so 60% to 30%, um, which is very, very good if you're a scalper. Um, however, you know, if you're around 50%, you want to overcompensate, you want to compensate for that with bigger winners than your losers. If you have a higher win uh, accuracy, like a 66% in this case, then you can get by with a one-to-one -one or a slightly more positive uh, risk reward. Um, so that's very, very important to be able to analyze because if your accuracy is, is crap, but your average win and average loss is one-to-one, -one, you're going to be losing money. Uh, but if your accuracy is crap, but your average win or loss is five-to-one, then you're a profitable trader and you, you know, your strategy, what you're doing is working. Uh, and if you can continually do that, then you can just scale up from there. I mean, some people like to have a low accuracy and a high, uh, a high reward to risk ratio. Some people like to have a higher accuracy and a little bit of a more of a one to one or 1 1.5 to one uh, average win to average loss, which is kind of where I'm at. I'm at like around a 1.5 uh, to 1.0 uh, risk reward or average win to average loss and my accuracy is kind of usually somewhere around 50 to 60 percent that's where I like to lie but very important metrics to learn to know is your average win average loss and your accuracy uh, just so you can know which side of the equation you should be working on in order to get profitable so some people have this down pat you know their average winners are better than their average losers but they can't find you know they're, they're they can't pinpoint a good trade they don't know what a good trade looks like and that's where you'll be able to look at your accuracy and be able to improve that <clears throat> and look to increase that day after day some people have a great accuracy you know they know exactly what the setups to look for but you know they have trouble cutting their loss and let's say their losses are huge their average loss is huge or they can't let their winners run uh, and their average win is low um, so that would be another part of the equation uh, if you reek on this part of the equation to work on, you know, maybe letting your winners run a little bit or being faster to cut your losses. Uh, we do have largest win and largest loss. Average position cost, so that is the amount of dollar amount of shares uh, for your average position. This is your average share amount. Um, and then your max consecutive winning, max consecutive losing. So pretty much straightforward. Uh, your average win duration, your average loss duration. Uh, if you're somebody who wants to work on cutting your loss faster, then you can kind of look to uh, dial this down a little bit. You know, your average loss duration should be um, much smaller than your maybe your average win duration because you want your winners to run a little bit. So maybe you'd want to work on... Um, getting that metric up a little bit so you can really kind of see this in front of your eyes you know, exactly um, exactly the statistic that you're looking at for what you want to work on so um, that is that and then when we get into our actual trade <clears throat> we can we get into here uh, whoops 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 Let's go back here. Okay, so when we get back into the trade, what we can do uh, is you can journal this this trade here. So you can actually write notes. First, you can you know you can log your your pattern, which is important. Uh, you want to be able to log 
each trade as a specific pattern just because you want to know what you're trading. You're not just blindly just buying uh, for no reason. You know, there has to be a reason to place a trade every single time. You want to be able to write that down in here as your pattern. You'll be able to track your metrics for that specific pattern over time as you log it. Um, and then in your notes, uh, you want to journal, you know, what's your risk level? What are you, what are you, what level are you risking off of? How many cents, how much percent, or <clears throat> a, which support level are you risking? Or if you're going short, which resistance level are you, are you risking? Um, you want to get that in writing because um, you want to be able to know exactly uh, what you were looking for in that specific moment because you never want to get into the habit of just trading and not knowing what you're risking. Uh, so before you enter any trade, you want to know how much you're risking. So it's important to write that down in writing and also knowing the target. You know, what are you looking for? What what type of breakout are you looking for? Are you looking for a 10 cent move? Are you looking for a longer term move? Are you looking for like a whole dollar of a move? Um, or is it a quick scalp? Or are you just looking for a quick five cents on a small trade? Uh, and you'll be able to catalog that. Um, the type of setup, like we said, you can put in here. <clears throat> and then also another important one is logging and journaling your emotions, how you were feeling in that trade. You know, is that trade a huge position or are you getting nervous? How are you feeling with that? Are you um, on a winner's tilt? Are you on a loser's tilt? Are you fearful? Are you fearful of a dump? Are you excited or you're like thinking that, oh, it has to go up and I'm not going to sell it until it goes up? You definitely want to journal your emotions because you'll be able to, you know, see a trend along you know, as you start to do this more and more, you'll see a trend with the things that you struggle with and you'll be able to be more aware of it so it doesn't affect you as much. So a lot of things to journal. Uh, it is very, very important to do that. Uh, like I said, every single uh, successful trader does this and that's how they improve and that's how they get to that high level of trading. Another thing that's really, really uh, important is being able to... <clears throat> Uh, record your screen. So recording your screen is an invaluable resource because you'll be able to look at the setup unfold in real time again and you'll be able to get that sort of repetition that you wouldn't get if you weren't recording your screen. If you were not recording your screen you can only watch the market once a day because it only happens once every single day uh, Monday through Friday. But if you're recording your screen you can watch the market anytime you want. You can watch it again and again and again and again and again five times a day if you wanted to, and that's how you can really um, get those repetitions in to learn faster. Uh, so that's also very, very important to do that, especially as a beginner trader. Um, what I use is Streamlabs desktop, <coughs> and I pretty much, uh, you know, you make your scene, um, you have your uh, audio input device or video capture device or display capture device, and uh, you'll be able to record your screen relatively easily. This is completely free. You can find that online uh, to download. <coughs> um, again, and uh, after you do record your screen, another problem would potentially be is where are you going to store it? So storing those recordings are also can be kind of tricky because uh, it's a big file. You don't want to keep that on your desktop because that you know takes up a lot of storage. So you can either do one of two things. You could either upload it to a YouTube channel, like a private YouTube channel, which is what I do, or you can get an external uh, device, an external hard drive device, and upload it to there. And then as long as it's not on your computer, it's not taking up all that space. So that's a very easy workaround uh, with managing those files. Um, the YouTube route is definitely probably the best route to go. You can just create a YouTube channel and post your videos as private or unlisted and no one will be able to see them. And you can kind of use that as your own little catalog and um, you can store your videos there and uh, then you can delete it off your computer. So uh, definitely is a way to go with that. So those are very, very important things as well. Um, you know, recording your screen, 
journaling, tracking your emotions, logging the setup, logging your risk level, your target, and also understanding your metrics on uh, Trade Journal will help you uh, become a better trader for sure. All right, now for this lesson, we are going to go over stock scanners. Scanners are very important because that's what's going to tell you which stocks are in play, and that's how you're going to find your stocks. Um, you know, scanners are very important because you want to be able to rely um, solely on them for the finding the stocks that you want to trade every single day. You don't want to rely on alerts. You don't want to pay for alerts. You don't want to rely on somebody else posting their watch list. You want to be your own your own source of information when it comes to finding stocks to trade just so you can rely solely on yourself and these scanners um, which will be a lot more reliable than asking somebody else what they are watching um, so what we have here up on the screen is our thinkorswim scanner which is what i use and a lot of profitable traders use it's very very nice scanner it's completely free for think of thinkorswim um, and I can show you how I set this up. Um, I do have a, a more, uh, more videos on my YouTube channel about how to set up my scanner, which are a lot more in-depth than what I'm going to go over here. So you guys can check out my YouTube channel, uh, Triad Trading. Just put that in the search uh, on YouTube. You'll be able to subscribe to me. <clears throat> and um, I do have a lot of videos based on my scanners. But we can do a quick you know, overview of how I set up my scanner as well as other things that you can use, other resources that you can use so you can find those top gainers, volume leaders every single day. Um, so first, let's go over some of our resources. We have our Thinkorswim scanner, as we said. We can scan for pre-markets. We can scan for the open, uh, market open. Uh, we also have Zendu. Zendu is a... Um, a scanner it's actually a YouTube channel and a lot of traders like to use this I'm um, I have no affiliation with Zendu or for promoting this uh, I'm just promoting this because people that I know are using it and so pretty much yeah these these uh, videos or these live streams are every single day and it uh, actually has a voiceover and it calls out stocks that are gapping up making new highs and then potential stocks that could be making uh, a decent move, volume leaders, etc. cetera. Uh, and that is very helpful, some traders are finding. Uh, what I also used as well, another resource, is, another, another resource is Market Chameleon. Market Chameleon is something I used early in my career. And um, yeah, you can scan for the most active stocks. This is for pre-market specifically. Um, gainers your top gainers your top percent gainers and your top percent decliners and this is actually where i found most of my setups early in my career however um, after some time you do need to refresh it every once in a while to get new data so that could be a little bit of a downside on that but yeah you can get market movers pre-market after hours there's a lot of other scanners as well very good resource to have uh, especially if we don't want to use Thinkorswim. Uh, you can also do paid scanners. I know it's people who use Momo Pro, um, which is like a momentum scanner, a uh, gap scanner. Some people like to use Lightspeed. Um, some, people, uh, some people like to use other paid scanners as well. They are out there. Uh, however, I think the best resource right now for free, for those not looking to make any Payments for that will be uh, Thinkorswim Scanner, in which we will go over here. Um, so here is my pre-market scanner. Uh, and to set up a pre-market scanner, um, the first thing we need to do is set up our regular parameters for stocks. Uh, so we have, uh, we want to scan in all stocks. And... Well, first, let's show you how to get to the scanner. Um, so yeah, you just hit scan, it brings up this, and uh, to detach it, what I like to do is just hit um, detach here, and it'll detach into a new window, and then you can put that on a second monitor. Um, but uh, so after we have that open, we want to set up our stock scanner. So you know, you want to add your condition, 
sorry, you want to add your filter and stock. And this will pull up a whole new uh, parameter to search for. And you want to have four of those, three of them being stocks and one of them being study. So the three for stocks, you have, want to have one for volume because you only want to be trading stocks with a volume over 100,000 or more. And it's very important because you don't want to be trading stocks that are not in play, that have no volume, that nobody's looking at. Um, and then you can have your max to, to infinite. Uh, you don't need to have any maximum there because um, the more volume, mostly the better uh, when it comes to trading small cap stocks. Next, you want to filter for your price. So price, you know, my minimum usually is 50 cents. I will go below 50 cents uh, if it's a very slow market. So I go all the way to zero up to uh, maximum. I really don't want to be trading stocks anything more than 100 bucks. Uh, really 50 bucks so I can really bring that reel that back in to around 50 bucks um, and that's where I'm going to scan for between zero and sixty dollar uh, per uh, per share and then we have our uh, last one here for stock our stock filter we want to scan for shares which is shares outstanding now since we're scanning for low float stocks we want to have uh, zero in this box here and then our maximum float. I don't like to trade stocks to float over a hundred million um, But you know in a hotter market you can be a little bit more lenient and pulled up a little bit more because of the more volume in the market We'll be able to move uh, Larger float stocks at a higher rate of change. So those are our three stock filters that we're going to be for scanning stocks now we have our study which is going to be between um, this is going to be to either set it as pre-market or at open or you know the market hours. Uh, without this study, um, it's going to be scanning just for stocks between 9.30 Eastern time and 4 p.m. Eastern time. Anything before or after that, uh, this won't have any data. Um, so that's why we put in this study. Go to add filter study and you want to click after hours percent change. After hours percent change, I know it says after hours. But it doesn't mean after 4 p.m., even though it is technically after hours. It also means pre-market as well. So between 4 a.m. Um, and uh, 9.30 a.m., it'll be able to scan for these credentials, these studies between um, you know, 4 a.m. to 9.30 a.m. Eastern Time. And after 4 p.m., you'll be able to scan as well. Um, so that's why we have that specifically for the pre-market scanner. Um, and we want to have a gap of at least 10%. I don't like to trade stocks. Anything less than a 10% gap, it's really not on my radar. So anything less than a 10% gap, I don't really want to look at. So only stocks with gap over 10% is what we'll be looking for. And I want that from the change of the close price. So anything that closed and is now priced pre-market or after hours 10% from the previous close is what I will want to look at. Um, and you can reel that in um, if you want or you can expand that a little more if it's a harder market um, and you really want to pinpoint on only the largest gappers on the day but I find 10% is good because it fil it's enough to filter out it's enough to filter out the stocks that are not in play that have no volume that aren't really moving have no news catalyst and it's also enough to capture the stocks before they make the move you know before they make a 100% move and catch them at 10% when they just had their news catalyst and when they just had their first 100,000 shares in trading. So that's why I like to have that 10% and that the volume is very important as well. You don't want to be trading anything with no volume. Now for the market open scanner, and you, once you get that set up, you can just save that, uh, save scan query and uh, save it as pre-market and you'll be able to find that in here. Uh, so for when you want to load it up, you just go to personal and it should be right in here. Uh, and this is now my market open. So the only thing that's different is we lost that study because that study is what had us scanning for pre-market. Now that we removed it, we'll be scanning only between 9.30 and 4 p.m. Eastern time, the market open hours. Um, now we have, uh, you know, our volume is pretty much the same. However, it's just a little bit higher because I don't want to be, you know, now that it's market open, I don't want to be trading anything with less than a million shares. 
uh, traded on the day. Anything less than a million shares traded on the day usually is not worth trading and uh, does not have any significant price movement or it has huge spreads and it's hard to you know get filled, etc. So I like to have very high volume stocks. That's why I up that to one million and plus um, after you know the reason I had it smaller in pre-market is because I'm much more able to capture a stock as soon as the news hits. So as soon as the news hits at 7 a.m., for example, at 7 a.m. Eastern time, um, I'll be able to see that on my scanner for the first 100,000 shares traded. Uh, so that's very important because I'd be able to get in as soon as the news hits or you know before the, the big move. But now that's the market open, likely that move already happened. And now I only want to be trading stocks with high relative volume. Um, so that is going to be with um, at least at least only at least one million shares traded on the day. Anything less, you know, it's just going to be clutter. So that's why I want to filter that out. And then the max is infinite shares. Uh, you know, low float stock. You know, I don't want to want to really be trading anything more than a hundred million shares outstanding or 150 million shares outstanding. Uh, the float is usually less than uh, the outstanding shares, as we've ex explained in previous lessons on float. You guys can uh, review that if you do not remember. Um, but yeah, it may have a float of, uh, it, may, it may show shares outstanding on Thinkorswim as like 150,000, but when you look at the float, let's say using Guru Focus or Finviz, the float may be, let's say, 50 million because there's 100 million in institutional ownership, et cetera and or insider ownership and that brings the float way down but it doesn't show in thinkorswim so that's why you want to be a little bit higher um, in thinkorswim for the shares outstanding because it doesn't exactly calculate the float for you because there's some that have a high shares outstanding even though there's high also institutional ownership which the float could be much lower so between zero and 150 million it's a little bit overkill i could bring it down to about a hundred a hundred, um, but you know that's good for right now. I don't find that that's really impeding my results. And the price, you know, I only want to be really trading between fifty cents and five hundred is a little overkill as well. I could really bring that down to about a hundred or less. So fifty cents to oh my gosh. 50 cents to about 100. I don't really want to be trading anything less than that. Um, anything less than that, I mean, anything less than 50 cents is not really worth trading because you have to take so much position size and you just incur so many fees um, just through sheer, um, even if you're using Thinkorswim, you don't have any broker fees, but you have you know, your, your exchange fees. Uh, which may only be a few cents per hundred hundred shares, but you know since it's a twenty cent stock, uh, you're gonna have to take you know a massive amount of position size, and it can, that can just eat up at your profit. Sometimes it's not really worth it, um, especially if you're in a cash account as well. That can also eat up at your account as well. Um, and anything you know, I don't want to be having it at zero because then I'm just gonna have so many stocks with just like micro penny. Um, charts that's you know aren't really worth trading um, and anything less than 50 cents you know the million shares can be traded a lot faster which still you know it may not be relevant for uh, a one cent stock uh, so i find that between 50 cents and 100 is a good zone you know 100 is still overkill i usually don't even trade stocks more than like 50 dollars so i could really reel it into 50 dollars but i'm finding that um up to 100 um, it doesn't really impede my results uh, so that's it for the market open scanner and here you have all the stocks that are gapping and this does this does update in real time which i like which is a little bit better than market chameleon in that way however um, if there's another gapper that shows up you do have to rescan it for it to show up so every once in a while you go you got to hit your scan button scan it again scan it again it's not automatic um, which is one downside of using thinkorswim i'm sure if you have a paid scanner um, you'll be able to get um, an automatic you know as soon as something gaps up it's hitting your scanner and you're getting alert um, 
which would be nice, which be, would be something that I would be open to investing in in the future. But for right now, Thinkorswim is working just fine. And it's great for beginner traders. It's great for intermediate traders. Uh, it definitely does the job. Um, and it's very important. It's like an in, another invaluable asset that you need to learn the ins and outs of because that's how you're going to find your stocks every single day. And you don't want to be relying on somebody to give you alerts. You don't want to be relying on a Discord channel. You want to be able to just sit down, look at your scanner, look at your charts, and not have and not need anything else to make money in the market. Just you and your scanner and your charts. That's really all you should need to be making money, and which is the reason for making this course, so you can be self-reliable in the market. So next, we are gonna go over um, setting our rules and boundaries in the market, which is very important um, you know, to protect our account and stay in the game long-term. So stay tuned for that. So now for the last lesson of this course, which is a very important one as well, it is going to be about setting rules and boundaries in your trading. This is also very, very important. A lot of successful traders have developed rules and boundaries in their trading so they can protect their account at certain times and also grow their account uh, at other times. So one of the most important rules that most traders should have I say most because I know there are some traders who don't have this, um, is a max loss rule. Some traders really, really love the max loss rule. It tends to save them hundreds and thousands of dollars uh, by abiding by this max loss rule. And that is pretty much when you are on a certain, when you are read a certain amount on the day, that is when you walk away, you throw in the towel, and you come back tomorrow. And a good, a good rule of thinking thumb is going to be about two times your average daily green day. Um, and that is going to be relative based upon, you know, most recency of past couple of weeks, past couple of months of your average green day. So if it's a hotter market, your average green day might be a lot bigger. So you will give yourself a little bit more room in a hotter market to go from red to green. However, in a colder market, um, you want to be a little bit more strict with your max loss. Uh, and if it's a colder market, you're having less green days. So your average, um, two times your average green days can be a lot smaller um, in a cold market than a hot market. So keeping it at an average of uh, two average green days uh, gives it gives you an opportunity to make that back uh, within one to two trading days, which is really where you want to be at. Uh, anything more than that. Then you start to dig yourself a bigger hole than you need to, and especially if you're not able to claw your back, claw your way back out. You could just be digging your hole deeper, deeper, deeper. But also, it gives you enough room. If you do go red on the day, you take one or two bad trades. Let's say you're down um, one to one point five your average green day. Uh, it still gives you that room, especially if it's a harder market, to um, bring it back. You know, to reel it back in. Uh, start to chip away some good green trades, start to get closer to break even, and maybe have a decent uh, green day, um, uh, a good profit on the day. So that is the max loss rule. A lot of traders, I, I know some traders who don't do the max loss rule. Um, they're willing to go deep, deep, deep in the red, and uh, they seem to be coming back out of it uh, relatively quick um, over time throughout the rest of the day if they do trade all day. Um, you know, they'll end the day break even after being down two or three thousand dollars in the red. Some traders are able to do it, uh, but I'd say that most traders are are not able to do it, and they're better off just taking you know the loss at three hundred or five hundred dollars in the red versus going down a thousand or two thousand and then just coming back tomorrow or the next day um, to make back that three or five hundred dollars uh, in your max loss. So that's how I find, you know, max loss for me is definitely very, very helpful. And uh, it does protect my account long term. So I don't get into a drawdown where um, now I'm losing a bulk of my account in one single day. That's the one thing that you do not want to do, especially when you start out, because you want to give yourself that enough time to learn the ropes in order to turn the corner 
So your max locks is going to be sort of your your panic button. If it, everything starts to go to crap, everything starts to hit the fan, then you can uh, abide by your max loss rule and walk away. But also, that's um, that requires discipline to be able to walk away at max loss. It's not always going to be easy. Um, your mind's going to be able. Your mind's going to play tricks on you to where. You know, just one more trade, or this trade up. This this setup kind of looks good. Maybe let's try it one more time. I'm already at my max loss, but I can just do one more trade, and then before you know it, it's one more trade and one more trade and one more trade, and you're down like three times your max loss. That's just not something you want to make a habit. So if you're disciplined and you can abide by that max loss rule, you can protect your account and stay in the game long term to have you know a solid, steady growth curve in your um, portfolio. Um, so here, uh, recently my max loss has been about 300 and most of the times, you know, once I get down to 300, between three and 400, I'm pretty much stopping. I have a couple days where I had some really bad days where it's double my max loss, uh, but those are rare. That was ha that happened twice within the past three years. So it's very rare for me to do that. Uh, and a lot of the times it's just hard, hard for me to stop at that point because let's say I'm only down... 200 versus 300 and I take another big trade and then I lose 500 in that and then I'm down 700 which would be about double almost double my last yeah about double my max loss um so it's important to manage your share size as well especially when you're getting closer to your max loss just so you're not oversizing um because if you take a loss on that one you know it could be well well by your max loss but um <clears throat> Yeah, um, it's very rare for me to be past my max loss. I'm pretty disciplined when it does come to that point. You know, I can just throw in a towel and come back tomorrow. And you know, with following that rule, you know, I had a pretty, I have a pretty steady growth curve. I don't have a lot of whips and crashes and reclaims and etc. that some people have. Um, another good rule is <clears throat> um, when you're able to read market sentiments. You know, you guys went through that the one lesson of reading market sentiment. If you can really dial in and understand market sentiment, then you can understand uh, time in the market because time in the market is another rule and boundary uh, that you're gonna need to have is you don't wanna be trading all day on every single trading day. You know, on some days, you know, let's say in this area where the market was a little hotter, you know, you can get away with trading all day and you can actually make more by trading more. Uh, but sometimes in this sort of market that we had a period here or even towards the tail end or currently right now um, at this point, which is October 11, 2023, um, the market is not very favorable to trading all day. Setups are just not coming every all, all day long. They're not. They're, the setups are just few and far between you know, once, twice, three times a day is maybe you have a good setup. And uh, if you were to trade all day and spend your whole day just trading and uh, you would probably be losing the profit that you'd make on those good setups. So it's very important to minimize your time in the market in certain periods in the market. And if you can read the market sentiment, you can understand when to trade more and when to trade less. And that could be a really good rule and boundary to set yourself uh, when it's a colder market. You know, if you know you're you're do well, you know, if you look at your statistics and you know you perform the best at 9:30 to 10 o'clock, like I do, uh, we can take a, take a look at my day and time. I perform best between 9 and 11, specifically before bef between 9 and 10 uh, would be my best, where I make the bulk of my profit. You know, in a colder market, I should only be trading during this time. I should not be trading any time else, even early pre-market or after hours or even power hour. I don't do very well or as well, I would say. Um, I should be minimizing. I shouldn't be trading at all, actually. I should only be trading the time where I am most likely to have a positive risk reward and a positive, um, yeah, a positive profit ratio or estimated value in my trading, which is going to be between 9 and 10. If it's a cold market, I'm probably not going to be able to get green trading power hour because there's just no setups or midday, there's just no setups in a colder market. So by minimizing the time in the market, setting that rule, setting that boundary, 
of minimizing my time um, and just being take a couple trades right at 930 or at 9 or at 10 and then getting out of the market uh, is a very good rule to abide by um, which can keep you green over the long term in a colder market <laughs> and then also if it's a colder market you can reel in that max loss a little bit uh, because your green day is a little smaller and that can be very helpful uh, another rule and boundaries that we need to discuss is the emotional boundaries um, you know understanding when you are trading off of fear of loss trace uh, chasing stocks averaging down greed uh, all these things can influence your trading and you need, you need to be able to set rules and boundaries around those as well um, so you need to understand when you are you know you see a big move in the market and ev and you're just like wow like I need I need I should have gotten on that or I, I missed it I need to wait for the next setup but it's already made like let's say a hundred percent move off the lows and it's super extended and you're trying to trade it after it made its big move that could be you know chasing the stock that's what we call chasing the stock is when you miss the first leg or the first setup and now you're trying to get in higher to try to compensate for the missed setup and uh, you end up taking a big loss or you're you take too much risk on an extended move and uh, you could be taking a, a pretty fat loss you could be the guy holding the bag on the backside and these small caps can move really really fast so that would what we be called chasing um, fear of loss is going to be kind of um, fear of loss is going to be kind of combined with averaging down so with fear of loss is when you're in a position and you're pretty much you don't want to take the loss you're so either you're convinced that the stock's going to work out or you believe that you know it's only a loss if you sell um, and you end up holding the stock or that setup and you ended up holding it for let's say more than you would like you know it could even be up as far as months or years um, you know, I've had we called it bag holding you know, I had bag held a couple stocks in my days and pretty much went all the way to zero um, until it got delisted that's happened a couple times um, Leftly learned my lesson but that was pretty much operating out of fear of loss I didn't want to take the loss um, I thought it would curl up and you know there's people in communities you know saying oh this is gonna be it this is gonna make a big move you want to get into it you want to average down this is Oh, it's great price at these prices. Oh, you definitely want to jump in right now. It's going to curl up. It's going to make a big move. You're going to be, we're all going to be millionaires. Just don't buy. Don't buy into the hype. You know, I've made that mistake a couple times, and that's just rooted out of fear of loss, fear of taking the loss and moving on, which is usually um, the best attitude to have in 99.9% .9 of situations. Is you know, if you take if you're if you're down big or if if it's just not working out, the the stock isn't working how you want it to work, and it you're just emotionally getting triggered because it's not doing what you want or it's not curling up or it's taking too long. Uh, you know, nine times out of ten, you're better off just taking a loss and waiting for the next setup or waiting it if um, a buyer comes in or another setup comes around uh, and then taking the next trade uh, rather than just holding and hoping it's going to come back and that is just operating out of the fear of loss um, and that's a tricky one that's a tricky one that's because uh, let's say you, you get into a stock and it just immediately dumps and you're down 20 cents you're like oh my god i'm down so much you know i can't sell now you know, I have to wait wait for at least some sort of pop, and it just keeps going lower and ticks lower and ticks lower and ticks lower, and it never pops. And you're the one bag holding the stock without even knowing it. Um, that's another that's another example of operating out of the fear of loss. And also, we can uh, talk about greed as well. Greed is another boundary that you need to keep. Um, kind of reeled in because in hot markets we could be getting huge moves in the market and you could have a massive day let's say you're up five times your average green day three to five times your average green day and you just 
you, you start thinking that every single trade you put on is going to result in a winner. So, you know, you start taking stabs at C setups or very, very bad setups, extended setups, very risky setups, and you're oversizing on risky setups because you think that because I'm up 3,000 or 4,000 on the day, I'm having a huge green day that, you know, this has to work out. The market is just so hot. And, you know, I've been on, i just been on a tear. Just every single trade I'm taking is just going, going up. And I, it, it feels like you're like a magician uh, in some ways. And so you, you get overconfident and eventually the market will humble, humble you when you are overconfident and you start to take bigger size on riskier setups and that's when you can really start to lose control. And if you do take a big loss on one of those on one of those risky setups on big size after you had a nice on a nice stretch of green, really nice green trades, beautiful trading, and you take one fat loss on a risky setup oversizing, that can really trigger trigger your emotions because before your mind was telling you, wow, I'm a great trader. This is amazing. I am doing great. Like, wow, my strategy is amazing. I'm going to be rich. I'm going to be a millionaire before I know it. And then you take one loss and it wipes everything that you just made on the day or a couple days uh, previously. And now your mind and the reality and what you're thinking in your mind is not matching up and it triggers these emotions and you're trying to fight reality um, because reality is not reflecting what you're thinking about yourself, that you're just an amazing trader and that you know how to do this and you're making lots of money, you're going to be a millionaire and now you're sitting down, you know, triple, quadruple max loss and you try to fight it. And if what you believe in your head is not matching reality, you sometimes, you know, are stubborn people like myself we will fight it, we will fight it, and we'll keep trading and keep trading until we get green and we just go deeper and deeper and deeper into red and that's when you start to capitulate and, um, and then now we operating on the other side uh, from greed now to fear. So when we're in a fearful state, we tend to cut our winners short and we, get, and we tend to hold on to our losers and that is not the way to trade. That is emotional trading and that's something that we would need to dial in um, and control. So it's very important to be disciplined when it comes to trading and understanding ourselves. It's very important understanding psychology, um, why you do certain things in certain situations, even though in hindsight it was probably the stupidest thing you could do. There's going to be a lot of situations where that's going to happen, but you have to learn by experience. It is very much like learning not to touch a hot stove um but sometimes you know it's not as clear and uh a year later we could be touching the hot stove again and then we touch the hot stove again in another year and then in a couple more years we touch the hot stove and we just it, trading is very it's not so black and white and uh we do have to continually be relearning our lessons uh, because every market is different and uh, some markets we it's just so it's just so amazing like the setups are beautiful and we are too lenient on our rules and boundaries so we kind of forget that the stove is hot and we just start taking riskier and riskier trades in harder markets and then before you know it you're having days like this where you're doing great and then just one day you just wipe it all out um, and that is me touching the hot stove and then here in about another couple months time I'm touching the hot stove again after a huge green day which is a theme that a lot of traders tend to have is a huge outsized winner and then the next day giving it all back and that is because of that overconfidence uh, the greed part of the um, the emotional index and uh, you get the whiplash back down to, <laughs> to the fear side before um, leveling out. Uh, and then there's me touching the hot stove again. So as traders, we are continually touching that hot stove um, because every market is different. It's, it's not so clear, it's not so black and white. It's not like that stove is 
it's not, I shouldn't even be using that analogy because clearly the stove is hot, but um, in trading, it's not so clear that the stove is hot because the stove is a setup that looks so beautiful, but you know, you maybe you oversize too much at the high, you oversize too much on a flush, it halts down, then it opens up 30 cents lower. You know, there's a lot of situations where um, you can be over uh, putting on too much risk in a bad position. So, so that was the course of 10 lessons for every small cap trader. And this course was really designed uh, to get traders up to speed to kind of get you exposed to the things that you don't know that you need to know in order to get success in the markets and also be self-reliable because self-reliability in the markets is probably the most important thing because if you are relying on other people in order to call out stocks, call out setups, um, show things on the tape or you know tell you what to buy and sell, uh, you're not going to make it long term. Um, the best, all the best traders started to hit their stride when they started to develop their own system, their own eye for the market, their own read for the market, and their own self-trust in order to trade um, and trade well. And that is that is the trick. Um, you need to develop your own system and you need to learn to trust it um, without anybody else's input because everyone's system that what you're going to find in trading is that everyone trades different and you're not going to find one trader that trades the exact same. Everyone is wired different in the head. Everyone has different susceptibilities to buying and selling. Some people like to hold longer. Some people like to hold shorter. Scalpers, long, uh, large caps move different than small caps, uh, futures, indices, uh, crypto, all these other things that all are so, so different and they appeal to different types of traders. And so the trick is trying to find the right setups, the right stocks um, that appeal best to you, that favor your strengths in order for you to develop your system and trust that as your own. And from there, you can grow as a trader because if you're just taking out alerts, there's no way you're going to be, if you're just trying to take alerts and buying and sell signals uh, from other people, um, you're just never gonna be able to survive long-term and you're gonna find that it's just not gonna work. A lot of people have learned a lesson the hard way about uh, copy trading, uh, especially with other people who are live streaming and that is not the right approach. The right approach, developing your own system, being self-reliable, in the markets, finding your own path, which can be difficult, but it is the only way you can succeed in this business is by forging your own path. Even though there are so many other traders that came before you, your system is ultimately going to be different and you can use other people's system as guides, as sort of, you know, where to look, how to develop your own system, you may even take attributes of their trading, but ultimately in the end, it's going to be completely different. So that's what this course was designed to do. I hope this course got value. If it did, um, check out my YouTube channel, uh, Triad Trading. You guys can also check out my, uh, my, my statistics in Trade Journal as well. I do upload every day. Um, up to trade journal so you guys can check out my trades every day. Uh, I also have uh, my live trading archives is available on trade journal as well. Um, I can pull this up. So if you guys are signed up for fast track, which clearly you are if you're watching this course, uh, you can just review my trading archive if you're interested in my live trading archive. There's no voiceover, it's just, uh, just straight charts and trading. Um, I also have a couple posts as well uh, that I do post. Um, uh, blogs and articles. I have a couple posts that are um, that are helpful as well. And we have in the portfolio. I do upload my trades every single day, so you guys can check that out um, as I upload every single day. And we are getting a stock that is popping up, so I will need to wrap this up soon. 
yeah, so I do upload every day, so you guys can check that out as well. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Look at this. Wow, momentum is coming into the markets. Massive move here. I am getting back into the markets, and see you guys later. All right, peace.